Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Autumn Gracia and I am here with Maria Aparis and we are on the board of the Quest ECSS and we are here with our very special guest with the founder of the Quest ECSS. And um, the Quest is a nonprofit and it's to stop child sex slavery. And we just recently did a fundraiser and a Facebook Liveathon um, in December. And so we have many people that have supported us. Um, we're very, very passionate about this cause. And what we want to do is educate you guys and spread awareness and just so you get a clear understanding of exactly how this nonprofit works, the legitimacy, what to look for, where the money goes, all these questions, just so everybody has a better understanding of, um, of what we're doing here. So I'd love to introduce Maria Paris. She's going to be, um, we're going to ask Z some uh, common questions that have been, um, that people have been wondering. And so uh, we're just going to kick it off. This is for you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. All right, Z, we're going to, we're going to dive right in. So right. my first question is, what is a nonprofit? Uh, uh, it's multiple things. Uh, when I first started it, um, you know, I, I just filled out the paperwork and, and got approved and all that good stuff. But then when I had to do my taxes at the end of the year, um, I started looking at it and asked all these questions about how, how much money came in from gambling, uh, how many people are being paid over 300000 how many people are being paid over 100000 uh, how much stock and bonds do you have, how much real estate and all this. And what I got out of that was that uh, essentially uh, the nonprofit is a place to put property so it's non taxable. Uh, not that all of them are like that, but some of them are. Okay. All right, great. Um, also, um, there's so many nonprofits out there. Um, sometimes nonprofits get a bad rap because maybe they um, are putting funds into something else. What is it that people can um, really, um, what, what are the signs that they can look out for for the legitimacy of it all? Well, what I've noticed uh, is a tendency that 6% of a nonprofit, I, I, it could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm correct, 6% uh, has to go towards the charity. So the rest of that can go wherever they seem deemed necessary for it to go. Um, you, uh, all these uh, statements, these tax statements and forms are of public record. And how you can find that is you can go online and there's so many of these, these uh, companies out there that that's all they do is they collect information about the, the what a nonprofit, you know, who a nonprofit is, the names of the board's members and the, the CEO, and uh, what happens to the money, uh, like uh, how much money went to this, you know, in other, in other words, like a financial statement. And the, like I say, like there's like GuideStar, uh, great nonprofits, other different ones like that. So when you say that 6% has to go towards the nonprofit, if if people are raising millions of dollars and only 6% has to go to the nonprofit, where does the rest of that money go? <laughs> well, I, I was trained by this one lady and stuff and I kind of upset her at one time and she stopped helping me. But um, basically like, uh, like the CEO was making $300,000 and I questioned her on that, it, you know, about her, what was her true intention? It, was it to make money or was it to do this charity? And uh, the answer I got was that she deserves that money. And then plus all of her perks were paid for. So you see a lot of the money going to airplane trips. Um, one of the other people that was trying to train me how to be a successful fund or a, a charity was to like, when I went to a place that uh, I would go out with, uh, you know, the, the people I was there to see and then bring along like public officials and things like that and take them all to dinner and pay for the whole dinner. And so I could explain to them about what my, uh, charity was all about. You know, also there's like other little perks where you give them gifts of going to a concert or, or whatever it may be, you know, smoozing people. That's where a lot of the money goes and then you start to see like it like I said in the tax form or uh, you know how many people are being paid over three hundred thousand dollars how many people are being paid over a hundred thousand so obviously it's something that's pretty common you know along with you know where where's all the real estate what does it have to do with the charity and you know those sort of things so how much do you pay yourself nothing uh, since 2014 nearly everything that 
has been uh, went to the quest has been out of my pocket. And then I've, of course, there's been people, you know, former friends and things like that, that uh, uh, have help donate small amounts it wasn't until the fundraiser that you guys did that we had any money at all and it's been amazing what we were able to do i mean it sounds like a lot of money but it, it it's not a lot of money but it was money that we could find a use for to make what we do better so that's how that money's being spent can you go into that a little bit um like where um the you know with uh, where the money goes um, and yeah. what it comes for, you know, like what they use it for. Yeah, you know, in the quest, the, the what we do is, you know, we, we rescue children and then we, we take those children uh, to a place where, like, say we go in military style, we take these kids, we take them to a place uh, that we make sure that we're not being followed or anything and that we're, we have the security of the kids. At that place, we have to, they get medical attention, they get nutrition, change of clothes, get washed up, you know, a lot of those little things making it new again. And then we have to transport them to uh, the place that we're going to take them to, which may be an orphanage, it may be a house, it, it may be one thing or another. And in that process, we're evaluating the kids whether or not they can go, you know, together or if they've made a bond with another little kid so that we're not, you know, making it more traumatic than it already is. Uh, we buy, uh, uh, like since the fundraiser, you know, before the fundraiser, if we were going to go do a rescue, we know that we're going to need medical supplies because the kids are extremely abused. And we know that we're going to have to have somebody look at them. You know, we're not going to be able to have a doctor there all the time or anything, but we have people that are considered social workers because most of our work is done in Asia because of the laws and restrictions here. Over there, we have one law. It's called human law. And so uh, we, what we've done uh, since then, instead of having to scramble to find medical supplies or having to buy them on the black market, which is always a lot more expensive, or getting food or gathering, you know, just gasoline for cars or not really cars. We they have motorcycle, trikes, tuk tuks, uh, these little mini trucks, all these different vehicles that we use. And so we get, we have to have gas, we have to have medical supplies, we, a change of clothes, and you know, so on and so forth. So what we've done was it's allowed us to establish little places in our field of battle that we supply these things so that now we choose to go do a rescue. You know, there may be people that we have to pay off uh, because the police are involved a lot of times, the government officials are involved, or just gangs. And so uh, we have to spend that money in order to allow us to actually make the rescue. And then, uh, you know, there's always something that comes up. So it's allowed us to establish that. Then we have, you know, we keep running out of places to put all the kids. You know, if we had the money, we could do this nonstop day in and day night area and collect all these little kids that are being abducted. And it's a never ending thing. So uh, we, we have to be able to, you know, establish the necessities to get in there. To have a kid, you know, it costs $20 a month for that kid for meals, for schooling, um, they're going to be better by once we take them than they would have been prior to the brothel. Um, then, uh, you know, there's medical things, uh, situations where they've been abused, they may need to see a doctor for surgery. So money goes towards that. But like recently, we had four of our charity, I mean, uh, uh, orphanages that were going to be closed because they didn't have the proper drainage. They did, the walls were cracked, foundations were, were broken. They didn't have walls between the kitchen and the dining room and, and so on and so forth. And you know, I've gotten pictures of that we've posted. Uh, so we went in and we fixed those. Plus they had paperwork that was out of date. The one thing that is very important in what we do is the culture in each uh, providence or, or territory that we go into is different from one to the next. And for the most part, like uh, your Christian or Catholic uh, type or organizations are not supported in any way by the government. Only the Buddhist ones are. So we went into these, these four locations and we made all the repairs and we actually made it better than it was before. And so now those have remained open and we didn't have to scramble to try to find 300 new locations for our kids. So that's where a lot of the money goes. So basically you're saying to summarize, since the, since the fundraiser that we did in December, you've been able to rescue now 144 children? 144 putting us over 1,500 total kids that we've saved. 
And with that, when you go in to do a rescue, which is led by all volunteers, yes. right, um, you've been able to set up these areas where you can kind of triage where what's what's happening with the children before moving them on to an orphanage yes actually will take them and some of these orphanages that you've been working with for several years have needed repairs and so you've been able to reciprocate them taking the kids and helping them with repairs yeah it's kind of funny we'll, we'll grab a bunch of kids and they they know it when we're coming and they know that we're not going to be able to pay to support these kids and they'll sit there and they'll throw rocks and nuns, actual nuns out there. I mean, the real life nuns, the ones that are out there in the real world, they're throwing rocks and stuff at us and, and yelling at us, you know, no, bring us no more kids and all that. And then they turn around and take all the kids. In. And so plus we do 24 hour security, which is really important for what we do uh, at each one of our locations so that the kids are protected that the gangs don't come back and, and get the kids from us uh, because uh, in the real world, uh, these other people that are out there doing it, mo first, uh, most of them don't do the complete thing, you know, from beginning to end. They just do either rescue or they take kids in, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, there's, there's always somebody needs to be at our locations to protect our kids. So what happens is, is uh, the nuns, whether they be uh, Christian or Buddhist, always seem to find something for us to fix. <laughs> so we kind of return. Uh, you know, the favor of taking in the kids with uh, doing repairs around the place. But yet most of that comes out of our own pockets. Okay, great. Wow, thank you for covering all that. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are most of the questions that people really wanted to know. Um, is, there, is there anything else that, uh, that you feel is important to share um, that people that you wanted to cover um, what? would want to know? Yeah, um, I think it's real important for people to know exactly what we do. Um, if you look on our uh, on the website, the, the quest ecss.org, there's a, a place you can find it uh, where it has stories. Uh, we write down and I've posted every single rescue that we've done, what took place, how it went about it, and uh, what was the condition of the, the kids and things like that. So you can get, can get a feel for how involved we are in that. Um, also, you know, uh, that's part of the transparency that we do. I also do videos. If people don't want to read, they can do that. Um, uh, the, the quest, you know, we don't have a, nobody gets paid. And so this comes out of our pockets. This is what we truly want to do. A lot, uh, we have uh, all kinds, we have every type of religion and race that actually volunteers for us. And, you know, if you can just imagine uh, a Muslim and an Israeli standing side by side, willing to give their life to, to protect or save one of these children. And then we, I mean, uh, we're, we're full scale. We do everything. We have a hundred percent retention rate. The, the next best in the business has about 12% because the children end up going back uh, either because they're not comfortable where they are or they're not getting the attention that they need and so forth. Also the soldiers that come to us, uh, they're either private security contractors, retired military, so on and so forth that volunteer so that we have to have coverage at each one of our orphanages 24 um, seven. They, a lot of, most of them are messed up. They have PTSD, so on and so forth. And when they come to us, it seems like they're cured almost instantly because it's really clear what we're doing and how we're going to go about doing it and what the objective is. And that's the same way with the quest as a whole. We know where we're going. We know what we're going to do. And, and anybody can, can ask us any kind of question that they want. What, what got you into starting this organization? <laughs> do you really want to know that story? I mean, it's in my book. But <laughs> How about a, a 60 second version of why? <laughs> I will do absolutely my best, but uh, you know, I'm so passionate about this. It's very meaningful and I really don't want to cut any of it uh, much 
too many, too many, uh, I don't want to cut it too much, but uh, essentially what happens is I was working as a private security contractor. A lot of times that when we were, had the downtime in between missions, I would go to Cambodia. I could, because back then it was very rugged and, you know, the streets were all dirt and it was just raw life passing by. And what I would do is I'd, I'd get me a big old stogie and a coffee and I'd sit there at the street and just watch life go by. Well, it got to a point where I started to notice that these foreigners were coming there. And that was just really awkward because, I mean, foreigners just don't go to places that have no comfort zone, you know. And um, so one night I decided to follow one of them. And as I followed him, I ended up, there was a whole experience there, but uh, I discovered what was going on. It was uh, uh, sex tourists for pedophilia. And the, generally that these people were coming from Japan, the United States, uh, the UK, um, you know, people that had the money to do what they wanted, were seeking to do. And there was a, a big call for it. Well, anyways, long story short, I go back the next day and I'm really messed up in the head. I couldn't sleep all night because it was like, this was all new to me. I didn't know things like this was going on. I knew there were bad people out there, but this to me is beyond that. It's a whole new category. So anyways, I'm down at the, uh, the restaurant at the cafe set next to the street with the dust and the life going by and I couldn't focus. And what I noticed that there was a preacher across the street and he had like three goons with him. And I, right away I knew what his intention was that maybe I was one of them and, and he was going to come over and save me, so to speak. And what happened was, is that, you know, uh, as he came around the corner and it was headed directly to me, I had positioned myself, you know, for safety and, and such so I could face him. And before he got to me, you know, I said, I had a, a saying or something about, you know, thank you for coming here. I asked God for him to send someone to me and just like you. And it kind of took him off his game. And then he sat down with the, his goons behind him and all, and, and we started to talk, and, and he figured out that I was not what he expected who I you know, was. And uh, he started to open up a little bit to me, which, are, which is really a bad thing to do when you're in this business. But he started to tell me about they were going to do this rescue, and there was like 14 kids down the street and all that. And I asked him how he was going to go about doing it. And after he told me, I realized that there was probably, he was probably going to get maybe one or two of those girls and there could be a chance where they all get killed or somebody, and it's not going to go right. So I told him here, let me lend you some of my expertise. This is what I do. I said, give me three days with your, with your guys. And I says, we'll do a rescue. So basically that was like the foundation for what we do now. I set it up, you know, uh, with uh, cars to, to pick us up and, told them how we needed to go in, what we needed to do, that they needed to be in control of themselves and, you know, not kill anybody with bad guys or anything like that, and how we could can prevent the kids from running out or getting too hysterical. And so we went in and, and we got this, and uh, it started my discovery of how really horrible this thing is, is that we were missing some of the girls, and uh, the preacher actually came in. He wasn't supposed to, but he came in and he started pulling off the wall boards. And these girls had places where they could sneak in. You know, you imagine they don't have like the two by fours and stuff, but if you can imagine a space like that in your wall, they had this place where they could go and hide inside the wall or else they could go up in an attic or, or down below where, you know, the temperature could be 150 degrees. And uh, so anyway, we got all the girls, but one, the preacher told me he's, she's back in this other room. So I go back and grab her and it's this little four or five year old girl. And, you know, it just sort of set me back a little bit, but, you know, the mission must go forward. So I grabbed a little kid, threw her up or, or grabbed her in my arms, and she was fighting me and screaming because she didn't know what was going on. And we make our way uh, out the exit to the, the vans to take us to the safe house. And on the road, it was about a three-hour three trip uh, to get us where we needed to go. And in that trip, I, I didn't want to look at her. And I took off kind of my gear and stuff, but she was still there with me. And the nuns seemed to, I mean, it was kind of weird how this happened, but they left her with me, you know, on my lap. And so she's sitting there and I'm looking out the window as time went past and she had calmed down about a lot. And I could feel like when you have eyes just staring into you, you know, and I didn't want to look at her, but for whatever reason, I turned my eyes and my eyes met with her and it was over at that point. <laughs> I knew what I had to do. 
Is that short enough or is it too long? <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing that. That's pretty profound. And, you know, it's just like one of the many stories. I mean, that's just happening constantly. And so, you know, to have that impact on you, I mean, of course, um, you know, totally can imagine like this is like why you are doing this. And we, uh, we want this all to stop. And uh, this is something we're very passionate about. And, um, and it can uh, be done. I have done it. <laughs> well, we are um, uh, really excited uh, to share some opportunities with everybody. Um, but the Quest ECS has some really great um, possibilities for people to participate. Um, and how people can contribute and be a part of this um, and really make a stop to this um, because the Quest ECSS is really out there making a difference. And so we want to share with everyone exactly how we're, how we're doing that and how it's happening um, and how you guys can support. And uh, thank you so much, Z, for having this interview with us. And um, I know Maria and I are just uh, so blessed to be involved uh, with you and to be involved with something that's so big, uh, making such a big impact. And uh, we're excited to uh, keep growing and move forward with this and um, you know, have the Quest community grow. So. Yes. One child at a time. That's all we ask, one at a time. Yes. All right, thank uh, you so much, C. We love you. We love you. you too. And you guys can, uh, everybody watching out there, you're, um, if you go to thequestecss.org, um, that is where you can go check out the stories. You can um, see what this is all about. You can see how you want to be involved in any way. And uh, we will keep you updated and posted. And until next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right.